leveraging new technologies, improving alignment with federal and local requirements, and simplifying compliance more generally. This is particularly important from our perspective as we're approaching the state's 2030 target for achieving a 40% reduction in methane emissions over the 2013 baseline. Um, just as a reminder, this workshop is being recorded and will be posted to the LMR meetings and workshops page. So thank you again very much to all of you for joining us today. And thanks for, to many of you for the ongoing engagement that has informed uh, these concepts to refine uh, the reg and uh, staff are, are excited to share with you. So with that, I'll introduce um, the CARB staff who are implementing the LMR, starting with Anthi. Hi hey everyone, my name is Anthi Alexiades and I'm CARB specialist on short-lived climate pollutant policy and looking forward to our conversation today. Hey everyone, my name is Sean Pinnell and I assist the LMR team in everything landfill methane regulation related. And I see some familiar names and some new names, so thanks for showing up. Hi everyone, this is Joe. Uh, today I'll be giving the presentation um, about preliminary concepts for potential improvement to landfill methane regulation. Again, I wanna thank everyone again for joining the workshop. Uh, before we begin, we would like to walk you through the Zoom meeting interface. Um, we do hope to have an interactive discussion today. There will be plenty of opportunities for questions and discussion. Please note that the chat function has been disabled to minimize distractions. For those of you who dial in to join by telephone or in listen-only mode, if you would like to be able to ask questions or provide feedback during today's meeting, please join using the link in your confirmation email. If you have any questions, ideas, or reactions, we ask, we ask that you use the raise hand function in the meeting toolbar. Um, depending on your Zoom setting, this may be located in the toolbar or you may need to click on the reactions button. When, you, when we call your name, you can unmute yourself and begin. Um, we ask that you give your name and let us know which entities that you're representing. We will take a 10 minutes break halfway through the presentation so people can you know, use bathroom or get some water. Following today's meeting, uh, written feedback can be submitted through the link on the LMR meetings and workshops webpage. The slides are also available for download on that page and the recording will be posted there later. First, we want to give you some background about the greenhouse gas and short-lived climate pollutant policies framework in California. In 2006, the Global Warming Solutions Act or Assembly Bill 32 first established the target to reduce statewide greenhouse gas emissions to 99 levels by 2020, a goal that was achieved uh, well ahead of schedule in 2014. Senate Bill 32 then strengthened and extended the goal to achieve a 40% reduction by 2030. Recognizing the need to rapidly reduce emissions of the most potent climate forcing gases to slow the pace of temperature rise in this decade, the state passed Senate Bill 605 and 3083 to implement a strategy to reduce short-lived climate pollutants, including methane. It requires an overall reduction in methane emissions of 40% by 2030, as well as a 75% reduction in organic waste disposal by 2025. Finally, Assembly Bill 1239 was passed in 2022 declaring the policy for California to achieve carbon neutrality and reduce statewide anthropogenic greenhouse gas emissions to at least 85% below 99 levels, no later than 2045. Next, we zoom into landfill methane policies in California. As some of you may know, the Landfill Methane Regulation, or LMR, 
was one of the first regulations enacted in response to AB 32 in recognition of the opportunity to achieve immediate cost-effective greenhouse gas emission reductions by controlling methane emissions from municipal solid waste landfills. In addition, the state has established the intent to phase out landfilling of organic waste and is currently implementing regulations to reduce organic waste disposal in landfills um, pursuant to Senate Bill 3083. Statewide regulations requiring collection of organic waste became effective last year, and those efforts are ramping up to enable expansion of organic recycling infrastructure. The need for additional action to directly control methane emissions was evaluated in the 2020, sorry, in the 2022 scoping plan update in consideration of the state's stringent targets to rapidly reduce methane emissions. Finally, landfill methane policies are built upon research and technology, which has greatly improved in the past decade. We now have a much better understanding of landfill methane emissions and effective reduction strategies. With more than 10 years of experiences in implementing the LMR, CARB has identified some opportunities for improvement in consideration of new technologies, lessons learned, and the state's ambitious methane emission reduction goals as we discussed in the previous slide. In the next few slides, we will dive into some findings from scoping plan update and research related to landfill methane emissions. Here, we want to highlight strategies that were identified in the recent 2022 scoping plan update. The 2022 scoping plan is California's strategy to achieve carbon neutrality by 2045. The scoping plan analysis of the waste sector showed that while reducing disposal is the most effective means of achieving long-term methane reductions. Reducing emissions from waste already in place in landfill is also critical to achieve short-term or near-term reductions. This figure shows the projected landfill emissions from 2020 to 2030. The black line shows the current trajectory and the gold line shows the projected impact of the 75% disposal reduction set by SB 3083 on methane emissions from landfills. The green line shows the impact of the disposal reduction combined with improved control measures at landfills. The scoping plan estimated that an additional 10% emission reductions can be achieved across the state's landfill by 2030 by implementing those improved control measures. As listed on the right-hand side, this improved control measures may include improvements in operational practice, use of low permeability covers, advanced landfill gas collection systems, and increased monitoring to detect and repair leaks. These are the primary strategies we will be discussing today. Next, we present some of CARB's efforts to improve our understanding of landfill methane emissions in California. Overall, research has shown that landfills are very complex systems and a wide range of factors including atmospheric, operational, biological, chemical, and physical conditions may contribute to variabilities in rates of organic waste degradation, methane generation, capture efficiency, and emissions. To advance CARB's ambitious climate targets, CARB has undertaken or supported a variety of research projects over the past decade regarding landfill methane emissions. This study has employed a wide range of different technologies 
as shown in this figure, which span geographic scales from individual landfills to statewide surveys and a wide range of temporal scales from hours to months of monitoring. Last December, CARB hosted a workshop summarizing the results from this research studies and the current state of landfill methane emission science in California. The presentations provided the perspective on the strengths and limitations of existing data and technologies employed so far. For example, we learned that the location and emission rate of leaks found by the Airborne Methane Survey can change even within a day. Um, this variability suggests that instantaneous emission rate data from remote sensing alone cannot inform us about emissions inventory as they provide only a snapshot of emissions at one point in time. However, there are very important new tools for methane leak detection and repair, as we will show on the next slide. We encourage anyone interested in new technologies and monitoring to explore the recorded presentations from the December workshop. Throughout the presentation today, we will highlight well this efforts has informed our concepts for improvement under the LMR. Among the new capabilities, we see that remote sensing based technology has its unique advantages. Since 2016, CARB has sponsored multiple field campaigns using airplanes to demonstrate the capability of such technologies. The results are very promising. Um, it can quickly pinpoint large leaks and promptly provide pool images to operators on the ground so they know exactly where the leaks are and repair them. An example of the plume imaging is shown here. This year, the first two messing satellites will be deployed by the nonprofit Carbon Mapper, and the state has allocated $100 million for additional satellites to provide more frequent coverage over the next few years. These satellites can provide us with an unprecedented capability to detect large methane plumes from all landfills and other facilities in California. It should be noted that satellites will not be able to detect small leaks or measure the diffusive emissions that are often spread out over the landfill surface. In addition, monitoring will not be sufficiently frequent to quantify any emissions from landfills. Still, we think it is an exciting new technology to find and mitigate large leaks and will play an important role to supplement existing monitoring efforts. I hope those slides give you a good background about the policy framework and research regarding landfill methane emissions and mitigation. Now let's turn to the purpose of today's meeting. The landfill methane regulation has not been updated since it was initially adopted. With the past 12 years of implementation and research, CARB has identified several opportunities to increase the effectiveness of the regulation and achieve methane emissions reductions. Leading up to today's meeting, we have worked closely with our partners at the Air Districts and conducted a detailed review of all landfill reports submitted over the last five years to identify common issues and areas for improvement in the mechanics of the regulation. This meeting is the first step to gather ideas and public feedback on potential improvements to the regulation. We plan to take the remainder of the year to develop and refine the concepts we will present today. And there will be further workshops with plenty of opportunities to provide feedback along the way. We hope to present a proposal to the board in 2024 and finally implement changes beginning in 2025. Before we dive into specific concepts, we want to provide an overview of the goals that we have 
um, emerged from the policy framework, research efforts, and scoping plan analysis, as summarized on the previous slides, as well as from our direct experiences overseeing the regulation and the feedback we hope to receive from all of you. The first goal is to improve methane emission control by leveraging research and technological advances. In addition to that, some other ideas we will discuss today include changes to improve alignment with federal requirements and local air district rules. This is an area where we really like to hear from landfill operators today. How can we better harmonize across jurisdictions? We have many ideas to simplify reporting, clarifying requirements, and update procedures and methods. And we will go over a few of them. But we are also interested in learning more from landfill operators and other stakeholders on this areas for improvement. In general, we think regulatory amendments are an opportunity to improve process, streamline implementation, reflect new capability and data, and fix what isn't working well for the regulated entities and the regulatory bodies. Finally, as always, we are aware that other states and nations look to California as a leader in crafting their own climate strategies. So we also want to make sure that we are setting the highest standard for our GHG programs. We break the areas of improvement into three categories, monitoring requirements, operational requirements, and reporting requirements, along with other miscellaneous improvements. We will start with the topics related to monitoring requirements first. On each slide, we will try to provide a brief explanation of the current regulatory provision for attendees who may not be very familiar with the requirements. Then we will introduce the potential approach for improvement and we will pause for questions and input after every slide. So please feel free to raise your hand at any time. Before we move on to the technical details, we can pause here and see if you have any questions about the background slides, the agenda today, and how to participate. Hey Joe, it looks like we have a question. Um, Veronica, I'm gonna unmute you and you could go ahead and just state your affiliation, that's optional, and uh, go ahead with your question. Hi, good afternoon. My name is Veronica Geary. I represent Hill Healthy Environment for All Lives, a small community-based organization out of Avenel. Um, my question is, um, I think this is really wonderful that we're doing this, especially with our community having a landfill right within um, the city limits. And we do have a lot of issues with that landfill. But I'm just wondering, where is the room for community outreach so that we're the community is aware of all the changes and every the areas of improvement that you guys will be working on. Is there anything that has to do with community outreach and um, and how is it even with the language barrier? Um, majority of the community also speaks Spanish, so that would be really important to have this type of information in the language in which is um, you know spoken yeah. in community of Avenel. Thank you. Yeah, absolutely, Veronica. Thanks so much um, for that question, or, or really we'll take it as, as feedback um, and an important reminder. Um, definitely appreciate, you know, you participating today. We do think this workshop and, and the series of, you know, additional workshops to come are the best way for the public to stay informed throughout the process um, and provide feedback. So um, if you haven't been through a regulatory, you know, rulemaking process with CARB before, it is a, a lengthy process. You know, this is just the informal, you know, preliminary uh, working together, gathering feedback and input and new ideas, um, answering questions. You know, we really want to put all the effort that's needed to help everyone understand um, the current regulatory requirements and climate, so that we can all, you know, get a better view on how we can make improvements that that work out best for everyone. Um, so again, your participation here today and in future workshops 
um, is absolutely the best way to engage. We're also always available, you know, to meet and have additional discussions and provide, you know, more background. Um, you know, we have a great office here at CARB to help us with translation and making everything accessible to the communities. Um, and we absolutely want to hear your feedback. So please don't hesitate to, uh, you know, ask questions or provide us any ideas from, you know, your valuable perspective as a community member who, uh, you know, is, has proximity to a landfill. Um, and we, you know, look forward to continuing to engage with you over the next year and more. It looks like we Great. have another question yeah. from Eric. Go ahead, John. Yep, yeah, we have another question from Eric Miller. Eric Miller, um, go ahead and ask your question. Greg Sissel, I work with Eric Miller. He forwarded me the uh, the meeting invite. Um, my question is, uh, I'm with Butte County at the Neal Road Landfill. Um, I see that CARB is really interested in methane emissions, but at landfills, but you, it appears as though you're kind of mute on methane emissions being created at compost facilities as that material is now being moved away from landfills. It's going to other areas to produce methane that is not being collected. Um, have you thought about addressing that? Thank you. Yeah, that's a great question. And I apologize, I didn't actually catch your name, um, not Eric out of Butte County. Um, but thanks so much for, for raising that point. Um, yeah, we absolutely understand that there are best practices for managing compost. Um, and, you know, we are uh, always working with districts to, you know, best keep an eye on how to make sure that folks are following those best practices, right? And keeping those piles anaerobic. Um, or using, you know, technologies like biofilters, um, et cetera, to make sure that, you know, where there are anaerobic conditions, those are being addressed. Um, so that's absolutely an area, of course, as you, as you noted, as we continue with our divergent efforts, um, we're going to need, you know, more of the organic waste is going to be managed in those alternative types of facilities. Um, so we think that will be increasingly important, and it's absolutely an area that we're keeping an eye on. Um, I will say I think it's, you know, out of the scope of the landfill methane regulation, um, but absolutely a really helpful and important reminder. Thank you so much for that. Great, thank you. And we have another question, and excuse me if I butcher people's names during this process. Uh, Al Boris, um, I'm going to unmute you and go ahead and follow up with the question. Great, thank you. Can you hear me? Sure can. Hey, this is Al Moores um, from WSB Consultant, um, um, Environmental Engineering, mostly landfill gas, compliance, ONM, and uh, gas collection system design. Um, one of my uh, challenges every now and then is to um, help clients to understand their gas recovery efficiency. And what we do uh, generally is to compare their uh, data, their gas collection data versus our models. And it, apparently there's no solid background for how to compare, uh, or let's put it that way, what's the best model to compare the actual field data versus a model. So I think there is some area of improvement to come up with a common model so that we could predict. I know everybody uses land gym, but how accurate that could be uh, is a big question. Uh, thank you. Yeah, absolutely, Albers. Thank you. Um, and, you know, certainly agree. There's always room for improvement in, in our modeling efforts. Um, you mentioned LandGem and CARB does have a tool that we developed um, for folks to use, you know, both for their expected gas recovery, um, as well as their heat input capacity, which is the threshold that determines at what point in time uh, you know, a, a new, a smaller landfill needs to go ahead and install a gas collection and control system. And what we've found over time is that, you know, the model is really great at determining, um, you know, that initial starting point, right? The, the point at which you're producing enough gas or you're expected to produce enough gas where you could, you know, operate a gas collection and control system or GCCS um, without using supplemental fuel, right? And sustain that flare 
or energy recovery device. Um, and, and then, you know, going on from there as, as landfills grow and become larger, right? And of course they're, they're controlled and they're capturing their gas flow, as you mentioned. Um, the models, we see a lot more variability, right? Between, as you, as you know, to, um, between, right. uh, what you expect to capture and what you're actually able to capture. Um, so I think that just really speaks to, you know, one of the primary reasons that we're continuing to and have over the past decade done a lot of research. Um, and, you know, again, as, as Joe said, uh, they are just really complex ecosystems, right? And it is so hard to, there's just so many variables um, at play. So, you know, I'm very hopeful that we'll continue to improve in those efforts. Um, and of course, as Joe mentioned, the, you know, the next generation uh, modeling or monitoring technologies um, are expected to really help us along that way. Um, so I think that's a really great transition and I don't see any further hands. So why don't we go ahead and move on to the monitoring requirements topic. Excellent. Thanks. All right. Thanks, Ansi, for your great uh, answers. Um, now we move on to the first topic. Um, as we mentioned before, one of our primary goals is to leverage recent technological advances in remote sensing capabilities to pinpoint large methane sources and mitigate leaks. Um, currently, mitigation is required for any methane exceedance detected via ground emission monitoring following the US EPA test method 21 leak detection procedure. Um, one of the ways we envision integrating the new capability is by requiring operators to investigate and repair leaks when they're notified that a leak has been detected using technologies such as satellite. Um, separately, under the current LMR, if an operator would like to use any new or modified monitoring procedure or technology, it must be approved on a case-by-case -case basis through an alternative compliance option request. Um, considering the technological boom in this field, we are considering establish a process to establish, to evaluate and approve the use of new technologies to supplement ground-based surface emission monitoring. That could be then available for other landfills um, to utilize. All right. Um, here we are revisiting the concept of surface emission, surface methane emission standard. When the LMR was developed in 2009, CARB initially proposed a 200 ppmv surface methane emission standard. However, stakeholders expressed concerns that this could increase the risk of landfill fires or interfere with the ability to meet federal wellhead monitoring limits for oxygen and nitrogen. Um, so CARB agreed to set the standard at 500 ppmv, so a reading greater than or equal to 500 ppmv is considered exceedance, which must be mitigated, and the required any leaks between 200 and 499 to be reported, but not mitigated. Now, we would like to evaluate the exceedance threshold and determine whether a reduced limit is feasible and warranted. Staff analyzed instantaneous surface emission monitoring or SEM results from all landfills from 2016 to 2020. We note that results across this years are very similar. So the figure shows only 2020 results as an example. The vertical axis shows the number of SEM readings reported by all landfills in California in 2020. Moving from left to right shows the results from the initial monitoring and each subsequent re-monitoring. SEM readings are color-coded based on concentrations. Blue represents exceedance greater than 500 ppmv. Yellow represents 
concentrations between 200 and 499 ppmv, and green represents concentrations below 200 ppmv. Through this analysis, we discovered that landfills are largely operating below 200 ppmv without adverse consequences. During the initial monitoring, readings below 200 are not reported, so we do not have an exact number of, for comparison. But considering the total area monitored at all landfills, we conclude that the vast majority of landfill surface area are below 200 ppmv. This is shown as the green arrow above the first column, which is not shown to scale, but we estimate that you know, it is at least an order of magnitude larger than areas with concentration above 200 ppmv. If the standard were revised to 200, to 200 ppmv in the future, we find that some additional mitigation may be required following the initial monitoring event, so as the orange bar in the first column. However, the data also show that 70% of exceedance were corrected to less than 200 ppmv level in the first remonitoring after initial corrective actions, as shown as the green bar in the second column and the subsequent remonitoring events. So here we would like to pause and see if we have any questions about this analysis, any concerns regarding the concept to reduce the surface, em surface methane emission standard. Hey, Joe, we have a couple questions. Um, we're gonna start with Frank and then move on to William. Uh, Frank, go ahead. Hi, uh, can you hear me? Sure can. Uh, I'm sorry, I, I caught the tail end of the last slide. Actually, I have two questions, one on the last slide and one on the current slide. Um, on the last slide, you said you're looking for a process of approving new technologies such as drones. Uh, just to clarify that, will, it's, will the requirement still be uh, that they have to be equivalent to method 21? Yeah, thank you, Frank. Absolutely. Um, that's that's certainly what we're envisioning, you know, that um, technologies like drones or or other new emerging monitoring technologies that folks would like to use um, would certainly be expect only be approved in the case that, you know, we had confidence that they were, um, you know, equal to or better than method 21. So what we're currently envisioning and, of course, open to feedback on on how this might work. Um, is that, you know, the drone would be a supplement um, to the existing ground monitoring. So they would continue to use the EPA method 21 to do their, you know, regular um, handheld, you know, uh, manual walking the surface of the landfill type of detection, but also use drones uh, to, you know, to really build on and improve that. So yes, absolutely. That's, that's what we have in mind. Okay, great. Now on the current slide, uh, just quickly, I was part of the uh, uh, the committee that helped ARB write the original L LMR. And uh, with regard to the 200 ppm or the 500 ppm, those were instantaneous uh, measurements. And um, at the time, uh, what we agreed to uh, was to model what the South Coast AQMD was doing. Uh, and recognize that the instantaneous measurements were more a measure of uh, problems with the cover, um, not necessarily uh, an indication of how well the, the landfill was performing. And that was the reason we recommended going with the integrated approach also, because the integrated approach was, was um, more towards uh, looking at how well the collection efficiency of the system was doing as opposed to just whether there was a leak in the cover. Um, so when you're, when you're looking, when you're doing your analysis, I, I'd appreciate if you could just keep that in mind that um, even the exceedances that you're seeing, which aren't a lot um, of the 200 ppm, uh, those are just cover issues. And so you really need to do an analysis of the 25 ppm integrated uh, measurements uh, and see how the landfills are doing with that with that standard, because once again, that's more an indication of of how well the landfill is doing in general. Um, 
Absolutely. Thank you, Frank. Thank I, you. I appreciate that uh, that suggestion and also appreciate your participation and the opportunity to learn from your experience. I apologize, I missed your affiliation. Could you tell uh, us? Again? Yes, I'm, I'm currently retired with Los Angeles County Sanitation Districts, but I'm currently a member of the, uh, the SWANA Legislative Task Force. Um, and so we, we're dealing with issues like this. Great, great. Well, thank you so much for your engagement, Frank. And My pleasure. Great, thank you. Um, okay, we have three queued up questions. We'll start with William Andrews, then on to David Rothbart, and then on to Bob Healy. Um, William, go ahead and ask your question. Uh, yes, I also was part of that initial group back in the day and had pushed back against the 200 limit as an enforcement level limit. And I, I'm with City of Los Angeles Sanitation and Environment. And based upon our experience, we saw that the 200 was most spots that were above 200 would be above 500. And one of the things I'd like to point out is that you guys are showing the counts of the readings, not a count that's weighted for the actual value. And with the, if you, look into the actual value that's uh we have many spots that are seven thousand things like that and so the total flow also besides the concentration of the heavier spots would be higher because they would be under uh more pressure and thus would have both a higher flow in addition to the uh higher value and so that 200 ppm it, it would is the area between two and 500 would show to be less relevant uh, than just the simple counts would show. The other thing is uh, prior to the adoption of the new regulations, our level for integrated was five, uh, it was 50 and it was pushed down to 25. And basically we've seen uh, uh, better overall uh, performance by worrying about that as well. And I think that that 25 is probably about the right number. I think going below that may not be the uh, the right number. That's extend my comments. Okay, thanks so much, William. We appreciate that. And certainly, you know, we want to, we're, we're grateful to have, you know, this data to analyze and we want to learn all that we can from it, um, including the integrated uh, results, as you mentioned. So if you have any suggestions for, um, you know, further analysis that we could do to learn from this data that we've been collecting, uh, by all means, please feel free to submit uh, some feedback through our website um, so that we can continue to develop these concepts. Thanks so much. Great. Thank you. Okay. We're going to move on to David Rothbart and then Bob Ulius next, and then we'll follow up with Nick Lapis. Uh, David, go ahead. Thank you, David Rothbard. I'm with the Los Angeles County Sanitation Districts. And I was curious about the remote sensing. And I understand that you're interested in supplementing monitoring with remote sensing. And at least what I've been doing here, our, our landfills, is we've been looking at drones and other sensing devices. And at least in our assessment at the moment, they're great screening tools but probably not the best quantification tools. I just wanted to plant some seeds as far as maybe there's some opportunities to have some type of hybrid monitoring system such you could potentially use a remote sensing device like a drone that could maybe be used more frequently to identify hotspots quicker. And then you come in with a handheld device to quantify that and remediate the hotspot as quickly as possible. What I'm alluding to is using the handheld devices is very slow, very laborious, but this is an opportunity to come up with a more efficient process where we could reduce emissions by having a more robust hybrid monitoring system. So I just wanted to throw that out there and see if that's something you're, you're amenable to. Uh, we are participating in CARB study looking at closed landfills right now, and at least the results I'm seeing look very, very encouraging. So I'm, I'm curious, are you interested in possibly uh, looking at that type of monitoring approach? 
Yeah, absolutely, David. Thank you so much for that comment. And I've seen lots of uh, thumbs up reactions from other attendees. So um, we really appreciate, you know, uh, hearing that perspective. Um, I think that is, you know, very much uh, what how we've also been thinking about approaching this, right? Um, it's really ideal if we can find solutions that you know, save everyone some money and find more, you know, leaks that we can remediate and mitigate. Um, so absolutely, I think we're we're on the same page there and appreciate that that feedback and support. Thank you. Yeah, I just want to add that we also sponsor some research, you know, CAR has sponsored some research using technologies like drone and do a, a direct comparison between Method 21 um, and the drone technology. And we are actually doing that um, as part of the uh, research activities. So yeah, we are paying attention to that. Okay. As a follow-up question real quick, as far as the, the methodologies available for remote sensing, are you looking at drones as being probably the, the most comparable to method 21? Uh, whereas I see planes and satellites being, like I said, more of a screening tool, but as far as something that would be integrated a hybrid method, are you leaning towards drones? Just curious if you have a, a sense of what technology works best. Sure, I mean, we certainly don't wanna rule anything out without evaluating its potential. And, and you know, I think as Joe mentioned, each of these technologies has its place, right? Um, has a way, a different unique way to contribute. Um, so I think, you know, drones in particular, if some of you may be aware, um, the EPA has approved an, a test, an alternative test method to 21 that's really more of a supplement than an alternative, as we've been discussing. So um, I think drones have just sort of been the first to demonstrate, at least to EPA's satisfaction, um, that they can, you know, function as a screening tool, you know, and most closely replicate the, um, you know, the findings that you would get through the handheld um, monitoring procedure. So, you know, I think that's one that's just sort of a little bit further along in terms of um, demonstrating to regulators uh, its effectiveness. But, you know, certainly we don't think it's, you know, the only technology that could be used in a, in a clever way um, to help us out here. So, thanks for that, David. Thank yeah. you. I um, just want to add that the goal here, just want to bring it back. We want to, you know, have a procedure. So, you know, drone is the sort of the one of the technologies that we are considering now, but, you know, who knows what will come next. And the goal here is to, we can have procedures. So methods like that uh, will be able to get approved if it has been demonstrated equivalent or even superior to the current method. So we allow them to have a, a uh, uh, more um, quick implementation if somebody decided to to use them in the future. So again, um, the goal is that we can establish a procedure not related to a specific method. Okay, great. Thanks. We're looking good on time. We're going to move on to Bob Healy's question. Bob, go ahead. Great. Uh, thanks, Bob Healy with Cal Recycle. Uh, former LA County Sanitation District employee. Uh, and there's a lot of people from the districts here. And Frank, what are you doing retired? It's you're too young. Uh, that being said, I just wanted to add uh, these. Are, those are good ideas. As you bring down, look at bringing down the uh, concentrations of, of methane, you might want to add carbon monoxide in, in the readings uh, to also pinpoint areas where fires may be starting. Um, I, I think because you're pushing the ability for the systems to operate effectively and possibly bring an air in, you, you might, besides monitoring in the, in the collection system, you may want to monitor in the surface emissions as well for, for the purposes of pinpointing where the problems are. Just a thought. Great. Thank you so much, Bob. I really appreciate that suggestion. Thanks for participating today. Thanks, Bob. Okay. Um, Nick Lapis, you are up. Hi, this is Nick Lapis with Californians Against Waste. Um, I was also in that original work group with Frank uh, 
what was it, 13, 14 years ago at this point. I have a couple comments. First of all, specifically on the, the surface emission standards with the 200 versus 500. You know, I was one of the people back then who was arguing strenuously that we do reduce it to 200. And, and the argument at the time was that it would cause landfill fires. And the compromise was, let's look at the data between 200 and 500 and then come back and reevaluate this. And actually a lot of the, uh, the FSOR and other things from back then specifically call out that it was the phase one of a regulatory process and that there would be a phase two based on this data. So even though it's taken a while, I think this is actually very consistent with what we discussed back then. And on the drones, um, we're, we're huge proponents of, of incorporating remote sensing and, and specifically drones into the emissions monitoring. The one thing I would just, I actually think I'm probably agreeing with other commenters, is that it serves a different role from the, the existing sniffer methodology. Um, and it shouldn't be looked at as a direct alternative. Um, so, you know, in addition to the fact that uh, uh, it, it just can more quickly help identify leaks, you know, it, it would, we would be able to do much tighter uh, uh, patterns, uh, monitoring patterns with it. We would be able to look at the working face and steep slopes, both of which are currently exempt from the regulations. And the, the frequency of, of covering the landfill could also be much, much greater with a drone. And so I want to make sure we're not just replacing uh, the existing you know, 30 foot serpentine pattern with a 30 foot serpentine pattern with a drone, because the drone is much more capable. Great. Thanks so much, Nick. I uh, really appreciate that input. And uh, I think those are really good reminders and, and points you've made. Um, and yeah, absolutely agree. We, we think there's some really great potential benefits for expanding the um, leak detection using these technologies. So, thank you. All right, I see no further hands raised. So let's go ahead and move. All right, thank you all for the nice questions. Um, next, we are considering how monitoring procedures could be strengthened to ensure effective mitigation of surface emission exceedance. Currently, the LMR requires surface emissions monitoring or SEM to be conducted using a walking pattern with a 25 foot spacing interval However, the full extent of the leak may not be identified. Research has also shown that corrective actions sometimes uh, do not mitigate the leak, but may simply divert it elsewhere. Staff is considering whether an, any additional monitoring procedures could help to determine the full extent of methane leak and ensure that the entire affected area is mitigated. For example, more closely monitoring with a reduced spacing interval around the locations where an instantaneous exceedance is detected to help determine the full extent of the leak and expanding the re-monitoring area to cover that entire affected area would ensure that corrective actions have successfully mitigated the leak. If you have any ideas for procedures, or suggested spacing interval that could help identify the total area with elevated methane rate, methane emissions, feel free to raise your hand now or provide written feedback. Yep, we have one raised hand, uh, William Andrews, go ahead. Uh, yes, at uh, the city of Los Angeles, what we do is once we identify that there is an emission source, we actually monitor out and uh, flag the area for repair to the minimum of a full bulldozer's width of uh, from side to side. And we typically will also not just mark to the end of the 500 limit, but we'll go down and follow whatever the crack is or whatever and frequently uh, flag down to the 100 level so that when the repair happens, it does happen 
in completion of the area. And so the idea of setting up the monitoring on the front end so that the repair will encompass the entire area is kind of important. And so it may be that you want to actually have the, the monitoring requirement to be uh, a higher or a, a distance of at least 25 feet away from whatever exceedance that that whole area has to be monitored. That is so great to hear, William. Uh, we always love to to find out when folks are going above and beyond um, the the minimum requirements and the regulation. Uh, we <laughs> really appreciate if you could, um, you know, sort of spell out that procedure for us in some written feedback. I think that that could be really yeah. helpful. You know, certainly one of our goals here is to, you know, a, a sort of side benefit maybe is, you know, we're creating a forum where operators can learn best practices from each other, um, and certainly, you know. Uh, CARB, we'd like to, you know, improve the consistency and and sort of get everyone um, operating in the ways that, you know, the, the pioneers have shown uh, can work really well. So I think it would be really helpful for us to know, you know, certainly more broadly, um, how many landfills are using practices uh, such as you described to identify the extent of the leak. You know, we we are not on the ground. You know, uh, often performing this monitoring ourselves. So uh, having your feedback on what those procedures should look like and and sort of how to spell that out in the regulation would be really really helpful. So thanks so much for that. The the other thing is that we uh, actually go instead of doing the four quarters, we do eight quarters as well, just to uh, because we've some of our landfills were very bad actors in the bad old days. And so we know we're uh, viewed with a very critical eye. So that's why we've gone to the eight quarters uh, concept. Wow, great to know. Thanks so much. Okay, next question is from Don Borrego. Go ahead, Don. Hi, um, yeah, just following up on uh, William's question or comments on, um, uh, fi exceedance finding. Um, what we do typically is if you're walking your grid and you find an exceedance, you we just throw a flag out, finish the grid, then go back and go through the whole area to find where the maximum point is, what the extent of it is, and all that, so that our mitigation, so yeah, so that we only have to mitigate it once. We don't want to do it and then come back and have to do it again. Um, the that's that's how how we've how we've approached to doing it um oh i forgot to say i'm with the yolo county a <laughs> central landfill um so yeah so i i think that maybe in an update to the regulation on sort of the specifics of surface emissions monitoring i don't know you want to spell out exactly how to do that but something along the lines of finding the the extent or the high point of a of an exceedance area should probably be called out. Great. Thank, Thank you so you. much for your input, John. Here we thought we had a, you know, a, a unique new idea. And it turns out um, you guys have, have already been using this practice. So really happy to hear about that. And thanks so much for that input. All right. I don't see any other questions uh, waiting in the queue. So let's go ahead, Joe. All right. Um, in addition to that, uh, we are considering approaches to ensure that surface emission exceedances are promptly mitigated by analyzing the corrective actions timeline in landfill reports. We discovered that the majority of leaks were mitigated on the same day or very quickly um, through simple actions such as making well vacuum adjustment or adding soil to increase cover sickness. Um, so we would like to, you know, explore the potential to shorten the 10 day period that are currently allowed for initial corrective action. Next, uh, we found some operators do not seem to begin the process of installing new wells right away. Then the second remonitoring event shows that a leak has not been mitigated. They may later have to request an extension 
uh, when construction cannot be completed within 120 days. So we are considering adding requirements for intermediate steps during the 120 day period to ensure that you know, preparations for new well installation begin promptly. For example, may include notifying CARB or district at the beginning of the 120 day period and potentially requiring certain steps in the contracting process to be taken, say, within 30 days or submit an amendment uh, design plan within 60 days. Um, we want to pause here and you know, take any feedback regarding those concepts um, about corrective action timelines that we were proposing or we were thinking about. John, you have another question? Go ahead. Hi, yeah, on, on uh, both of the, uh, so on the first re-monitoring, you know, the initial corrective action step, um, I do not think that shortening that is even, even though most of the time we're able to conduct the corrective action within a day or the same day or right away, um, the actual re-monitoring um, can often be weather dependent um, and where we're at, wind is often an issue for remonitoring as well. So I don't think being able to do that in 10 days reliably is uh, sometimes a challenge. Um, so I, I, I would, I think keeping that at 10 days is, would be better. Um, and then on the 120 day period for, uh, adding additional wells, um, I think I would, I would like that the additional corrective action, the longer term corrective action or permanent corrective action, whatever you might call it, um, be broadened to not just be in, in putting in more wells. Um, sometimes we have a case where we're getting ready to do a final closure. If we would put in a new well, and then two years later, we've sucked most of the gas out of that area because we've done a final closure. It's spending a lot of money and not getting a lot of benefit for it. Um, I, so I think that uh, having some alternatives to just putting in a new well would be a, a good idea. Thank you. Thank you so much, John. Yeah, so uh, take your point on on the first point, and that's that's really helpful to hear that sometimes, you know, you're able to actually mitigate the leak really promptly, but the remonitoring, you know, for, for various reasons, including weather, um, it would be challenging to shorten that time. So it sounds like maybe we could think about um, kind of bifurcating, like take action within you know, three or five days or something like that. Um, but still keep that that remonitoring period at 10 days. So that's a really helpful suggestion, and we'd love to hear from others um, about that idea or, or you know, uh, to what extent we could um, feasibly shorten the the action timeline, if not the remonitoring timeline. And secondly, yeah, absolutely take your point on new well installation. Maybe that's not always um, the the right solution to the problem. So that's another area we'd really love to learn from folks, you know, what else um, has worked for you in that, that 120 day, or as you said, permanent um, corrective action period. Thanks so much. Okay, Eric, you have a raised hand. You can proceed with your question or comment. Yeah, this is Craig Sissel again with Butte County. Um, as with what John said, I don't think reducing the days from 10 to seven or whatever is beneficial to most of us. Uh, we're a rural landfill, and it, we have a different group that does our surface emission monitoring than does our gas collection system adjustments. So for us, it's a scheduling issue. Uh, when they come out and find the exceedances, we then have to reach out to another company for them to schedule coming out and adjusting the gas collection system before the, <clears throat> before the next 10-day comes up, as well as the 120-day <clears throat> period um, again, being a public agency, we have public contract codes that we have to follow, notification of our board, um, board of supervisors, which doesn't always align in this 120-day period very well. If uh, our next board meeting that we can get to is 35 to 40 days out, that eats up a good portion of this before we can even release a bid package for expansion of the gas collection system. As well, then you have to issue the notice to proceed, 
the company then has to order the parts and schedule their drill rig to come out and do it. And a lot of times that 120 day period gets exceeded because of all those actions. So reducing it, you're just going to, I mean, unless if your uh, goal is to collect more fines for NOVs, that really doesn't benefit a lot of us. So um, just want to throw that out there. Thank you. Yeah, thank you so much, Craig. Um, absolutely, we we do understand that it can be a lengthy process, especially for those of you um, who are public entities. So, you know, we'd really appreciate if you can sort of help us, you know, think constructively about how to achieve these goals um, in a way that's also workable. Um, so let's all put some thought into that. And, you know, the, the feedback docket uh, will be open for 30 days um, so you can help us contribute. And of course, there'll be plenty of opportunities coming along over the next year for us to sort of brainstorm and, and develop those concepts together. Thanks so much. Okay, we're, I don't see any more raised hands. Joe, you can go ahead and proceed. Okay, uh, the last item that we want to cover in the monitoring section is component leak monitoring. Um, currently, the requirements for quarterly leak monitoring lack a detailed procedure. Um, this may lead to inconsistent or inadequate monitoring at some landfills. Therefore, staff is considering adding more prescriptive requirements for component leak monitoring and increased stringency to require robust leak detection procedures at all components containing landfill gas. Um, before we move on to the next section, I would like to pause here to see if anyone has any question or feedback on you know, this concept or the previous slides related to monitoring. William Andrews, your hand is raised. Go ahead. Yes. Uh... I think this is another case where screening with uh, different technology would be helpful to find things uh, to focus on fairly quickly. Um, the other thing is that we have kind of a unique situation in one of our landfills. Uh, I We monitor at five different landfills for the city of Los Angeles in that we have an older landfill that has just carbon scrubbers. And so once it, it, the landfill gas goes through the carbon scrubber, it goes out the stack without a flame because it's down at like 10% or something like that. And so for us, monitoring for leaks before it goes through the carbon scrubber or in process of that is kind of not really the most brilliant way for using us our time because the gas is going to go out the stack anyway, the, at least the methane. And so all we're doing is scrubbing the higher hydrocarbons. And I think our time would best be spent on a landfill like that, working at basically figuring out a way to capture that methane and use it. But again, landfills are all unique. Yeah, thank you, William. Um, that's a that's an interesting case, and we'll have to put some thought into that. Appreciate you raising it. Okay, Michelle Applegate, I will unmute you and go ahead. Yes, hi, I'm Michelle Applegate with Project Canary. Um, just has has there been any study of what I would call more continuous monitoring technologies? You know, under the what's happening with the EPA subpart supplemental rulemaking and this idea of defining a continuous monitoring technology. Is, is CARB considering anything um, in that realm right now? Understanding that a lot of the landfills are different and it, it may not work for every single operation. Yeah, that's a great question, Michelle. Um, Joe, I think you're actually better equipped to, to field that one if you'd like to. Yeah, Michelle, thanks for the question. Uh, yes, we are conducting some research using um, sort of low cost continuous monitoring um, technology to um, basically trying to have a 24-7 uh, emission monitoring 
over the whole landfills, right? Um, and we're still in the testing phase, sort of the pilot study phase, uh, trying to see first if that technology is promising that warrant, you know, further steps. We're testing right now. We are in, sorry, we're in the phase of um, selecting some of the landfills for testing as well as um, testing the sensor themselves. Um, but we think that's, you know, definitely one way to go is if we can have, for example, uh, continuous monitoring over, let's say, all landfills in California, that would be, you know, a, a very ideal situation. But we also have to note that based on what we have known so far, um, the cost of implementing the, such a technology over all landfills, big and small, is very costly. So we are also considering that as, again, a supplemental method to the current uh, method 21. And to see, you know, for example, certain type of landfills is better suited to use that technology or, you know, depends on the size or the history. Um, but to answer your question, yes, we are interested in that technology and we are testing it right now at a very small scale. Awesome. If there is there the opportunity to provide data um, to CARB as part of this process, will there be a comment opportunity? Oh, absolutely. Yes, we would very much appreciate um, any you know data studies, research, um, any type of experience learning. Um, so yeah, we had a, a link at the beginning, and we'll we'll provide it again at the end. Um, if you go to our LMR meetings and and workshops page. Uh, you'll be able to submit feedback that way, and we'd, we'd certainly appreciate that. Thank you. Thank you, yeah. Michelle. And you're also able through the comment log uh, website to attach any materials, so be it Excel data, CSV files, or anything like that as well. Okay, our next raised hand is Bob Healy. Bob, go ahead. Okay, um, just as far as the component leaking, <clears throat> Keep in mind that 90, 95% of the gas collection system is under vacuum. So any leak would be into the gas system and not out of the header line. Um, so the majority of, of the system that could be leaking is at the collection station, the, the flare station or energy station where the gas is then put under pressure to get to the flare or get to the energy plant. So that's where the focus of what ever leaking might take place. Certainly there are some times where individual wells could be under positive pressure because the gas system is, there's a lateral that's filled with water, condensate or something. But 95% of the system should be under vacuum. Um, and then <clears throat> to address William Andrews uh, situation in LA landfills. <clears throat> We're looking at Cal Recycles, looking at landfills that are on the downward side of production of gas. And LMOP of all of all agencies, US EPA LMOP, Landfill Methane Outreach Program, is providing a a, a webinar in a couple weeks. I think it's June thirteenth, where they're they're taking landfill gas from a San Diego landfill and pushing it through a biofilter where the methane is actually oxidized in a compost pile, basically. Um, so I would recommend both ARB and um, Mr. Andrews take a look at that as we're, as I will be doing that at the same, same time to see about the applicability. I've heard of this before on the last decade or so. I haven't really seen it, but I think it's a it's a possibility for the, the lower end gas production uh, pushed through a compost pile where where the gas methane is oxidized. Thanks. Thanks so much, Bob. We really appreciate the you know learning from your experience, and thanks for the heads up on the LMOP webinar. That absolutely sounds like something we want to tune into. Okay, next up is Alex Bataro. Excuse me for mispronouncing your last name. Go ahead, Alex. All right, can you hear me okay? Sure can. Okay, thank you. 
Um, I, I'm, I, I teach at UCLA, I work with UCR, uh, University of Riverside. We're working on a project where it was a CARB sponsored under Hershey's uh, Enforcement Division. I'm sure you're familiar with it, where we're using uh, UAVs with a platform with a uh, uh, sensor box to monitor seven different landfills in Central and Southern California. And one of the components that I would like to submit for consideration here is how cost effective is any one technique to assess uh, where the leaks are as to be able to mitigate those leaks as soon as possible as to lower the emissions whatever they are, as soon as possible. So timing and how quickly a technique is applied to stop or mitigate these leaks, I think should be a component that's taken under consideration. So that's that's really all I wanted to say. Great, Alex, thank you. We certainly agree and appreciate the input. Okay, I don't see any other raised hands. Joe, uh, you may proceed. All right, uh, so next we will move on to the improvement concepts regarding landfill operations. Uh, but first, we have reached the halfway point in our presentation, so we would like to pause here for a 10 minutes break. Um, so let me see the time. We are we will resume about 2.26. So right now it's 2.16. We will resume 2.26. So please enjoy a quick break and uh, rejoin us in a few minutes. Okay, welcome back. I hope everyone had a quick break. Um, now we will move on to the improved concepts regarding operational requirements. The first concept we are considering here is to minimize emissions during gas collection and control system or GCCS disruptions. Currently, the LMR requires operators to have procedures in place to minimize emissions during repairs, construction, and other situations that may require temporary shutdown. Um, meanwhile, the US EPA emission guidelines require the gas mover system and all valves in the collection system and in the collection and control system to be closed within one hour of the collection or control system not operating. Staff understanding that this is a common practice for some landfills and has been very successful in avoiding methane venting during period of downtime. Therefore, staff is considering adding more prescriptive requirements to align with federal requirements and ensure effective mitigation actions are taken during GCCS disruptions. Um, we want also to understand what other areas could be modified to better align with federal rules. Okay, um, in addition, we understand that, you know, reducing the duration of downtime can help avoid large emission as well. Um, so this slide highlights a valuable lesson learned from a recent CARB sponsored airborne methane survey in which operators voluntarily participated in a remote sensing notification and mitigation campaign. Leaks were identified during airborne methane emission survey Bloom images were shared with operators, and the operator reported back whether they were able to confirm the existence of leak using handheld detectors, whether they were able to repair the issue, and what was most likely the cause of the leak. The pine chart here summarized the leak causes identified by operators. We found that the most common cause of leaks was collection system downtime, nearly half of the exceedance. Most of the time, this means that either a well was taken offline at the working phase or allow active filling and well raising 
or it was in an area where some GCCS construction was taking place. This is an important new information because these areas are often exempted from surface emission monitoring for safety reasons. We believe that operators were not aware of that significant emissions can arise from well downtime. Um, we would like to pause here and learn more about what experiences operators or consultants and other experts may have with practice that can allow the GCCS to continue operating while active while activities like filling or construction are ongoing. We're not seeing any hands at the moment, so I think we could proceed and we can always go back to the slide, Joe. Oh, now oh, we wait, do. we got we got a couple. Um, let's start with Frank. Frank, uh, go ahead. Hi, uh, maybe you're not seeing hands because I don't think this is an issue. Um, I know at least in the South Coast AQMD, and I, I'm sure in other air districts too, the larger air districts, um, is we can't take our system down. Um, I mean, if we had to, if we had for some reason to take the system down, we'd have to get a variance to do that. So I don't think you're seeing major landfills uh, in most of the air districts uh, doing something like this. I'm not sure where you got your survey and what people were doing, but um, Frankly, yeah, I don't, I don't see, a, I don't think this is much of an issue. Let me see if I can clarify something here. I wonder if, uh, if this is the disconnect. Um, the collection system downtime includes an individual well being taken offline temporarily. Yeah, because even there, I know in, in South Coast 11.50.1 and, and a lot of this, I think it was similar in the LMR to a certain degree, um, is there's very def definitive uh, it, procedures you have to go through to take, take a well down. Uh, you just can't turn them off. Uh, so uh, the, these are not common practices that I know of. Um, so I'm just wondering how big of an issue this really is to be concerned about. Yeah, well, it sounds like we could really benefit um, from you know someone maybe sort of breaking that down for us and describing what those procedures look like that you follow. Maybe we need to organize a tour to Southern California. Huh? <laughs> so thanks so much for that, Frank. We appreciate it. Sure. Okay, next up is Bob Healy. Bob, go ahead. Uh, yes, uh, I, I'll pose this to the to those that are uh, on the call. Um, I know back in the day when I was working as an operator, landfill operator, the horizontal collection systems at Pointy Hills were very effective and didn't require any shutdowns. We can run full speed ahead with the systems and we just built horizontals as we went. So there was no vertical wells to take out and to and to extend up. I don't know if that's still, at least for the larger landfills, something that's being done so that less of an impact on gas collection points, whether horizontals or vertical wells, that that would be helpful uh, for some of the smaller sites that haven't used them yet. I just throw that out. Anybody have any input or response to that? Thanks, Bob. We've got several people waiting in the queue, so maybe we'll we'll get an answer to that question. We'd certainly like to have a better picture of that in our minds as well. All right, uh, John Bertigo, you're up. Hello. Um, yeah. So the one of the things that we have since our our landfill is fairly shallow as these things go um is we are often moving our active face around a bunch to as we're building up in different areas and so we do end up taking sections of the collection system offline for uh you know a couple of months while we're filling in an area and then they're back on and then whether wells are horizontal or or vertical um there's, uh, 
you know, there there are wells, so things are in and out, in and out, in and out. Um, so I could say so I, I I don't know that we I think this people need to be aware that this is an issue, um, that it's not, you know, the you know, it's not the whole system going down, it's collection system being down. And that it, and that for us by far is a the, that and the cover cracks like thing here is are the bulk of the potential areas for us having uh, emissions issues. Um, yeah, thanks, John. Uh, maybe you can sort of help us better understand um, why is it necessary to uh, take the wells offline when you're creating a new active face area? Is that for safety reasons or um, just some sort of operational constraint? I think that would be helpful if we sort of had a better um, yeah. So uh, two main reasons. Mm -hmm. uh, one is operational constraints. We don't want to be running over the collection piping that runs from the wells to the, our main header headers and things. Um, so as we're filling in an area that has been filled and has wells put into it. Um, the other is uh, reduce the potential of pulling air into the gas collection system, you know, pulling fresh air into the gas collection system as we have the cover open where we're filling. Um, and there's, so it, it's, it's those, those are the two main reasons why we have, where we'd have, and it's not a huge area generally for us. It's, you know, it's wells within 200 feet or so of the active face. Um, so it's a couple of acres of our overall 350-ish acres of landfill area that are off and in and out, but they are definitely offline. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Thank uh, you. Yeah. That's that's really helpful, and I think, um, you know, that's a, a really great example of where, you know, if, if it doesn't seem to be um, very easy to avoid that downtime altogether, how can we think about ways to sort of shorten the duration, right? Or minimize that area where you're not right. having active collection, right? Because I think, well, it was new information, right? Because these aren't areas that you're typically um, monitoring with your handheld detector while you have, you know, bulldozers running around and whatnot. Um, it's also sort of intuitive, right? It's not surprising. The reason you need a well in that area is because you're generating a lot of gas. So take away that, you know, that well or that vacuum. And of course, you know, you're going to have elevated emissions. So I think it's really important, you know, this has certainly been really eye-opening for us and, and we do want to, um, you know, think, work together to find really practical ways that we can, you know, keep that to a bare minimum. I sort of liken this um, as an analogy to, you know, when there's construction on the highway, right? And they shut down 20 miles, but they're only working on, you know, a few hundred feet or a, a mile each day. Um, and so that's sort of along the lines that we're thinking and, and really appreciate everyone sort of, uh, you know, trying to think creatively and come up with, with better solutions here. So thanks, thanks a bunch for that. Um, and, I, and I also want to say, I think it's, it's really helpful for us to have perspective, you know, from you operators um, you know, to the ex what extent does this pie chart kind of reflect your own experience regarding the causes of leaks, right? I mean, this is just a, you know, a sample of, of a few landfills um, over a, you know, a certain period of time, a couple of years. So I think it would be helpful if, you know, you know, what to hear some folks reaction like, oh, well, we, we most often find that it's just in sufficient vacuum or something else that that appears here as a more minor cause. So that's another um, question I'm going to throw out there to everyone. Um, but we can move along to William. Go ahead, William. Let's see. You disappeared and you're back again. OK. Go ahead. Um, one of the things is about the collection system downtime, we know that unlike what we had thought many years ago, that landfills do provide a main source of emissions of, of methane early on before a lot of times the gas system is in place near the working front and all like that. And one of the things that I've 
become aware of is over at the Sunshine Canyon landfill, uh, SCS Field Services has been working at basically building vertical wells from the bottom up. And so they actually start by putting uh, a vertical pipe in, maybe slightly shallow, but it's sitting in the fresh trash and they uh, surround it with rock inside of gabions so that it'll hold in place. And then they extend it as they go up. And so the wellhead keep mo keeps moving up and they're able to put vacuum to that very quickly. And so after you know a short order, they have the, the daily cover or whatever, and they begin to uh, hook the gas system up to that. And they, they're seeing really good uh, indications that that's working well. And the Sunshine Canyon is one of those landfills that there's a lot of neighbors nearby that are complaining with odors and stuff like that, to the point where there's an LEA on site every working day, all the time. Great, thank you, William. I, I really appreciate your ability to paint a picture there. That was you know, more valuable than the uh, you know design plan sort of construction documents that we sometimes get to see. So thanks for describing that process. Um, and it sounds like um, you know that that's been a positive experience where it's it's not taking too long to um, to reconnect the vacuum as you're doing your well raising. So thanks for that. Okay, next up is. Oh, where did he go? I didn't see the hand. Someone raised and lowered a hand. Oh, Will Schreffler, did Everybody. you want to okay. just go ahead and re-raise your hand if you uh, wanted to comment or question. Otherwise, I don't see any other raised hands. Great. Let's go ahead and move on. Um, so I just want to say one last thing here is that, you know, the, the, the report is forthcoming uh, with more details regarding those feedback from the operators and our findings from those campaigns. So, you know, keep an eye on our uh, methane research webpage uh, for this detailed report, if you're interested in. Um, for those of you who attended our December research workshop, may recall this figure, uh, which was one highlighted from an extensive research effort sponsored by CARB and CARICYCLE and conducted by Cal Poly University from 2017 to 2020. Um, this study found that cover type was the most significant operational factor affecting landfill surface emissions. This figure summarizes flux chamber measurements taken at five landfills in areas with different type of cover in place. The width of each gray bar shows that there was significant variability between landfills. However, we can see that the average flux show in the black line across each bar is several order of magnitude lower in areas with final cover than those with daily cover. In general, the coarse, coarse meat material typically used as daily cover were least effective, while thick final covers were highly effective. Um, we also see that some intermediate covers made of soil that were sufficiently thick were also able to achieve a high degree of control. Uh, this finding shows that cover materials matters in controlling surface methane emissions and suggest that reducing the area and duration of daily cover is a promising strategy to reduce emissions. Um, we would like to pause here and interested in your ideas of how to accomplish this more practically. Let's give it a few more moments for people to uh respond. Yeah, and this kind of relates to the last slide, right? Where we're seeing um, wells offline for the sake of active filling. Um, you know, we can think about this area of daily cover as 
you know, another sort of area we'd, we'd like to understand whether it would be possible to kind of minimize that area, right, to shrink it so that you have, um, you know, a smaller working face um, each day. Uh, John, your hand is raised. Go ahead. Hi. Yeah, just thinking about the daily cover situation. Um, one of the things that's not included in this for flux is tarps, which we often use for the sort of the overnight daily cover. Um, we generally try and minimize the use of these other sorts of daily covers, um, soil, because it's we're trying to save that for use in interim and final covers and for construction and whatnot, because we, we don't have a whole lot of extra. Um, and the other things are just not great, even for daily cover, um, just for, for other daily cover reasons, vectors and such. Um, the, so I, I, so I could see where that, where the, 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 you would expect a high flux through daily cover. Um, I'm, for the the final cover one that says alternative, I guess that was just one project that somebody did where they have a fairly high flux on your chart. Um, but yeah, yeah but, but we we absolutely see for final cover things where you know our cells that are covered with a geosynthetic liner, uh, once we sort of get everything sealed up and buttoned up tight, uh, we have no emissions. Uh, it's just... Great, and then... Yeah. Oh, thank go you. Ahead. Yeah, thank you, John. I, I appreciate that, and uh, I'm really curious to um, learn more about the types of tarps that you're uh, utilizing, and um, if anyone's aware of any, you know, research that has, um, you know, looked into the effectiveness of those types of materials, we'd certainly love to learn more so we can include them in, in the future in these types of figures. Thanks so much. Great, and then Craig, using uh, Mr. Miller's uh, pen name, go ahead. Thank you, yeah, when I look at this data, I see something different than what you all have brought up. Um, I actually work on a landfill. I didn't start a job in a, in a, a air board uh, system without any prior knowledge or anything of this group. So what I see here is you're comparing three different totally separate things. Daily cover is six inches of soil. Interim cover is 12 inches of soil. Final cover could be three to five feet of soil. These are totally separate comparisons. You're always going to see Six inches, of, six inches of soil emitting more emissions than 12 inches of soil versus three to five feet with a geosynthetic. So you're kind of comparing apples, oranges, and bananas here. They're not really the same comparison. So to me, I don't know that this data really shows much other than what I would expect from seeing six inches versus 12 inches versus a final cover. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know that there's much you can really dedu deduct, deduct from that. Other than that's what you should see from these type of comparisons. Sure, that makes sense, Craig. Thank you. And and I do want to say, um, you know, it was challenging to actually pick one figure <laughs> to represent the findings of that study. Um, they actually, you know, did a really deep dive and characterized 31 different uh, types, if you will, of cover. Right. So far beyond this this breakdown of you know daily intermediate and final and whether it had soil or green waste or you know green waste layered with soil et cetera um, you know they really uh, did a deep dive and you know took samples and did a lot of um, you know geological or geophysical uh, characterization of each of those uh, material types and you know certainly looking at factors like thickness as you said. Um, so really encourage anyone who wants to learn more about that to check out the link here on this slide. The full report is about 500 pages with at least 500 figures in it. Um, so a lot to be learned from that. And, you know, the, the issues with daily cover really emerged as one of the primary things that, you know, we'd like to, to learn more about and see what can be done there. So I uh, definitely appreciate and, and respect that, that perspective, Craig. We hear you. Thanks. 
Okay, we're going to go with Melissa next, and it looks like John has re raised his hand. So, Melissa and then John. Looks like Melissa unraised her hand. Uh, John, did you have another comment or question? Oh, sorry, Melissa, go ahead. My apologies. I lowered my hand before I realized I was not unmuted. Uh, Melissa St. John with SCS Engineers. I just wanted to point out um, in this, you know, similar to what Craig was pointing out, is that when you're looking at closed landfills versus active landfills, closed landfills are going to be 100% final cover. So a vet, you know, the entire landfill is covered uh, with final cover. When you're looking at active landfills, you, you have to consider, I believe, that a, a vast um, majority of the cover material, even on an active landfill, is going to be an interim interim cover or an intermediate cover versus an active or daily cover. So your active area is a very small percentage of the total landfill cover area. So I just wanted to, to point that out. Thanks, Melissa. That's a great point. Appreciate the feedback. Okay, next up we have Stefan Rosenblum. Stefan, go ahead. Hi. Uh, yeah, I'm um, not an expert like most of you on this issue, uh, but I just had a simple question about the, the graph. I don't understand what a, a negative uh, flux is. Does that mean that it's going into the landfill? Because the, uh, the abscissa starts with minus 10 to the third, and then it goes to tip plus 10 to the fifth. And I don't, I don't understand what the negative flux means. Yeah, that's absolutely right, Stephen. And I'm sure the uh, you know the academics who wrote up the report could give you a, a much more thorough explanation than I can. But you're absolutely right. That's what a negative flux represents. It's that the um, concentration of methane below the surface of the cover is higher than the concentration above. Okay. So okay. It, it tells you the direction of flow that's happening, basically. Mm -hmm. Okay, let's see. Next up is Nick. Nick, go ahead. There we go. I was I was muted. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Go ahead. Uh, just a couple of quick comments on on the cover. Um, I'm sure you all are aware, but the, the data that we have from the the you know Sunshine Canyon and some of the other landfills where uh, there was the uh, satellite or I guess the airplane flyovers and the satellite data immediately after various mitigation measures did show that the the cover type was one of the most effective ways of limiting emissions. So definitely appreciate you looking at that. Um, something that did come up when we were discussing this 10 years ago and, and never really got resolved, and, I, and I'm going to admit I'm, I'm not an expert on this, but if I recall correctly, one of the things that was raised at the time was that um, you know uh, most landfill operators fill individual cells in a, in a pattern and attempt to not fill the entire cell and close it, but go in a, in a, and I know there's 50 people on the line who are probably cringing right now because I'm totally messing this up. Um, but basically uh, don't go from, you know, beginning to end on a single cell, but fill individual cells and come back to them within the time frame that's allowed so they don't have to go to final cover. Um, and th there was definitely a lot of discussion the first time around about uh, the, the pattern in which landfills are filled being a way to maximize the amount of the waste that's under final cover. And so I would just suggest that we consider that again. Okay, we're going to go back to Melissa. Melissa, it looks like you re-raised her hand. Uh, go ahead. My apologies. I intended to lower my hand. Okay, we'll go to the next person, no problem. Uh, Bob, go ahead. Yeah, uh, from CalRecycle again, one of the obvious indicators of this final cover versus daily and interim is that it could, because landfills, active landfills 
generally are a combination of daily, intermediate, and final covers. It may push the concept of possibly closing slopes as you build up uh, to minimize the amount of potential exposure. It's something that Calorie Cycle had intimated back, I don't know, 10, 20 years ago. The close as you go kind of concept for for uh, post closure uh, finance financial assurance. Um, so you, so operators didn't have to maintain large or create huge sums of uh, funds in their accounts to accommodate a, a full closure of a landfill all at once. So you, you could you could close as you go. So you don't have to collect have as much money on hand at any particular time. So this kind of, um, uh, you know, yes, this is obvious showing final covers are much better than daily covers, but the question that is going to be, is being raised because of this is how much can we encourage uh, closing slopes as you go up or, uh, regulating the placement of interim covers more frequently, allowing the use of green waste and wood waste for daily covers as an alternative daily cover. Is it better to use soil only? Those are the kinds of questions that are really being shouted out from this kind of a uh, table. Yeah, but, absolutely. But we, we, need, we need input from operators because we, we need to do the right thing. <laughs> that's operationally satisfi uh, satisfactory for a majority of the group. But I just, I need to say this. Okay, we have a series of hands. <laughs> Sorry, Sean, can you <laughs> yeah, please go ahead, please go ahead. <laughs> yeah, thank you so much, Bob. Really, really appreciate that. And absolutely wanna, wanna underscore our, you know, eagerness to learn from folks. Um, and Nick as well, you know, before you suggesting that uh, this pattern where, you know, filling pattern where we're sort of closing each cell as we go along and, and putting in final cover um, more, more quickly, uh, really want to hear from everyone, um, you know, how, how feasible or challenging that would be. Um, so let's uh, just look to your written feedback for, for more on that. Um, I see we have a few hands raised, um, but I'm wondering if in the interest of time, we want to keep going. We'll certainly have lots of time at the end for uh, discussion, and we're happy to, to circle back to any slides that we didn't, everyone didn't get to share their thoughts on. Um, does that sound okay, Joe? Uh, I'm okay either way. Um... Oh, and Joe, why don't why don't we get through this section and then we'll pause at the end of the section? Great. All right. So uh, now we are considering ways to improve landfill gas collection to capture additional methane. Um, the LMR currently requires well filled monitoring and tuning to be conducted monthly. Uh, we know that some landfills that conduct that conduct more frequent tuning have demonstrated improved gas collection rate. This is an area we would like to further explore and learn from your experiences. Uh, we are also very excited to hear that some landfills in California are exploring the potential to install automatic collection systems. Uh, these systems can optimize gas collection by making adjustment as atmospheric conditions change through the day. So we would like to hear whether operators are aware of this new technology and if there's any barriers that limit the adoption of such a automated uh, collection system. And I think we're just gonna go to the end of the section if that was agreed upon and then we'll, we'll take any questions, Jill. All right. Um, and this is the final topic in this section. Uh, we would like to discuss the criteria for permanent shutdown and removal of the gas collection and control system or GCCS. Um, as some of you may know, currently the LMR lists three requirements. 
The first one is that the GCCS was in operation for at least 15 years. Um, however, as we all know, landfill gas generation varies significantly depending on the landfill's size and other conditions. Um, some landfill generates significant quantity of recoverable methane for several decades. This is example shown here on the right, uh, where a landfill in California has been closed and has operated a gas collection LGCCS since 1990. After 30 years, it still collects significant quantity of methane and is projected to require a control system through 2060. So that's 40 more years to go or over 70 years in total. Um, therefore, we are considering removing the 15 year minimal period and instead applying a measurable threshold for removal. We are interested in feedback regarding you know, parameters that can reliably indicate when control is no longer possible, such as the minimum flow rate or a minimum methane content. Um, next, the LMR requires that there have been no SEM exceedance for a unspecified period of time. Um, however, the absence of SEM exceedance, let me underscore, with a GCCS in operation, does not demonstrate that the surface methane emission standard could still be met after a GCC is removal. Therefore, staff is considering a demonstration period prior to removal, during which the landfill would demonstrate that emission standard can be maintained with GCC is turned off. Finally, the required equipment removal report is a notification that does not explicitly give regulators the opportunity to evaluate whether all removal criteria has been met. Staff is considering making this a request similar to an alternative compliance option request, which could be denied if the operator cannot demonstrate that the emissions will remain below the threshold. So we would like anybody to share their thoughts on this concept. Um, and like, like we said before, if you have any questions regarding the concepts we presented in the previous slides, uh, we will pause here and see uh, if you had any, any questions or feedback. Okay, hey, thanks, Joe. We're gonna pause here for questions and we want around 3.15, we'll move on for the rest of the presentation. So let's... Keep that in mind and we'll start with Mark uh, Roost. Mark, go ahead. Okay. Um, so a couple of things, slides 21, 22, and 23. Uh, UH, ultra high performance concrete or UHPC has tensile strength far stronger than conventional contract, cures fast, and could be done a section of a landfill at a time. And can make a gas tight seal with a uh, formulation specifying that a lot of different, you know, there's been about 180 different formulations of the HPC that a friend of mine works with. And so um, what I, I think that it'd be good for you guys to get familiar with that and consider it um, and its characteristics in terms of setting policy going forward. Thank you, Mark. I really would love to learn more about that. So appreciate if you can submit some written feedback for us through the website. How do I, oh, to your website? Yes, correct. You'll find a feedback link on our meetings and workshops page. We'll share that at the end of the presentation. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, next up is Tom Borrego. Go ahead. Hi. So, uh, on the previous slide about the automated collection, we're going to be starting a uh, project to do that on a bunch of our wells um, and see how it goes. Uh, here in the next month or six weeks, we'll be starting to put in some equipment and, and do that with a, a contractor. Um, big drawback to it is that the stuff is not cheap. Mm. Uh, each wellhead uh, monitoring equipment is to buy outright is well over a thousand dollars. And then if you have a 
connection service and data collection, you know, that's additional, an additional cost to, to manage that or, or, you know, cloud storage or all the things that make it easy to use these sorts of computer things have a cost associated with them. Um, so we'll see how it goes. Um, but that is that. So, but we are going to be trying that. Um, and then on the second thing for the closure of a of a gas control system, um, I think leaving in a minimum time is fine. Um, but yeah, you, I think you do need to specify some operational criteria for when it's okay to remove remove or close down a system. Um, we have one cell that is getting close to where we would probably ask to shut it down, but it's it we're not there yet. There's still too much. It still produces enough gas that we don't want to close it down, even though the gas itself is just a hassle to deal with because the quality is so low. Yeah, thanks so much, John. I appreciate that. Um, both the the you know perspective on the challenges with the automated collection systems, um, but really encouraged to hear that you're gonna give it a try and see how that goes. And we'd love to follow up with you along the way. Um, and uh, also appreciate the feedback on the criteria for um, removal of the wells. And if you have any suggestions about you know. Um, the sorts of metrics that can reliably indicate that uh, we're, we're all ears and, and eager to learn more. So thank you. Okay, next up is Craig. Craig, go ahead. Okay, can you go to slide 21, please? Yes. Um, so one of the one of the comments here, um, again, I'm not trying to bash anybody, but again, this is coming from someone that appears to never have worked on a landfill in a in a manager operational standard before. The reason that we cannot close a landfill as we fill is due to structural integrity of the landfill, um, access to grounds for soil stockpile. So sometimes we have to do sliver builds of cells or modules because we're limited on site by where we can place the soil to use for daily cover or intermediate cover. And then the other one is financial. Um, sometimes you, you don't have enough money in your coffers to go out and spend $12 million on one major build. You have to acquire that financial uh, equity over time to be able to go do that big project. So just to give some more information out there as to why we can't just close landfills as we fill. Um, that may shed some light on that for you. Uh, then slide 22, um, well tuning actually uh, used to be my expertise for 10 years. Uh, if you adjust the well filled properly, you should only be doing micro tuning of it anyway. There's not major tunes that are needed on it, unless if you go putting in a larger scale flare or add another engine to the, uh, to the, um, energy production. Um, otherwise, yeah, the only thing that's really going to change those the well quality is a rain or a surface water for dust control. As most of us know in this industry, water is the catalyst for gas production. So if you put a final cover on, the reason a lot of times it dries out and doesn't produce gas anymore is you're limiting water into that uh, trash to be biodegraded further. And barometric pressure will change it as well slightly. Um, so with those two things, there's really no need to uh, increase uh, well tuning or monitoring more than monthly. Um, just my two cents, so thank you. Thanks for the feedback, Craig. And we saw several thumbs up. So it sounds like we've got some uh, additional attendees who, who wanna underscore and, and agree with those comments. I don't see anyone else in the queue. So before we move on um, from the operational requirements topics, do we have any other comments on the last few slides? And if not, we'll have a, another discussion period at the end. We got a raised hand. Uh, Nick, go ahead. Hi, um, I wasn't sure when to raise this, I, I assume. Is we're moving away from operational requirements now would be the time. Uh, we would strongly encourage you to look at prohibiting practices that increase the generation of methane on the first in the first place, uh, namely leachate recirculation. 
that is among the lowest hanging fruit for reducing fugitive emissions. Thanks, Nick. Appreciate that. And, uh, you know, happy to take any uh, comments or, or reactions from anyone else um, in, in written feedback. So that's it, it looks like. So let's go ahead to the next section. All right. Now we move on to the final area of concepts, element reporting and other miscellaneous overarching improvements. First, CARB is considering how to best standardize and streamline reporting to simplify compliance. Currently, there's no standard format for LMR reporting. We have received reports containing lengthy narratives, non-uniform data, and operational records, which are challenging and resources intensive to review. For example, um, CARB staff spend more than 1,500 hours per year uh, just reviewing the reports for compliance. Um, we want to remind everyone that we have rolled out templates that can be used for LMO reporting. The templates have been voluntarily adopted by many operators, and feedback suggests that they, they can simplify compliance and help reduce errors and emissions. We are also exploring other options, such as online reporting system, in order to streamline reporting. This is procedure. There's no raised hands, and we'll have time at the end as well. So, sure. As we said early, we think regulatory amendments are a good opportunity for us to clarify some reporting requirements and fix what has not been working well in the past. Um, staff has identified some common reporting errors, misinterpretations, omissions, and over-reporting in LMR annual reports. Some examples are given here. Um, for example, you know, quarterly component leak monitoring, flare temperature, and system downtime. Um, we would like your feedback on any provisions that you have found to be unclear so we can identify how to help avoid inconsistent uh, interpretations. Next. We are considering clarifying the applicability of the LMR for third-party and off-site control device operators. Um, if gas control devices are not owned or operated by the landfill, some device operators have interpreted that they're exempted from the LMR requirements, such as quarterly component leak monitoring and annual source testing. So uh, we would like to update the regulation to clarify that third-party and off-site device operators are subject to monitoring and reporting requirements for landfill gas control devices. Okay, we have a question from William Andrews. Go ahead, William. So, at, uh, for example, Lopez Canyon, we have a uh, cogen that is operated by a private company and we have the city flares uh, system. And so they're pulling on the gas system or, or we are. So they have their own 1151 permit for to ASC AQMD. And when their components are under pressure, they should be the ones responsible for their uh, components that are under pressure. And when we're running the flare and we have things under pressure, we're, we should be responsible. Are you guys suggesting that we should be responsible for all of the uh, components of theirs that are under pressure? And I know that this may not be the case here, but uh, now, but at one point, one of our landfills had a compressor plant that sent the gas in a pipeline about four miles away to another landfill. And so would, in that situation, would the, an operator like that be required to monitor the surface above that pipeline all that distance? Thanks, William. That's a, a really great question and appreciate the opportunity to clarify. 
Um, so no, I think we're we're looking at this the same way that you are, that the device operator, whoever that may be, should be the responsible party. Um, but we are open to feedback on that. Um, and I think, you know, at the end of the day, so long as, you know, the requirements are being met, um, you know, we're, we're not primarily concerned with who's responsible, you know, again, as long as it's, it's clear where the, the division of responsibilities lies. So we're happy to, um, you know, learn more about different arrangements and, um, you know, uh, weigh in uh, where necessary, um, but really, really uh, interested in, in everyone's feedback on how that might best work. So thanks for that. Okay, I don't see any raised hands at the moment. I think we could, oh, well, uh, Frank Taponi, uh, go ahead. Hi, Frank Caponi again with uh, the SWANA Legislative Task Force. Um, I just wanted to clarify uh, and something that maybe you'd want to think about. I, earlier, I had made the comment about I didn't, uh, about uh, the issue of of uh, uh, do we see gas in in daily operations or or uh, that type of thing, and I, I know my, I realized after I said that my perspective is one of mega landfills, uh, not the smaller landfills that that do operate significantly different. For example, we, um, uh, you know, we never, we never remove wells for daily cover because we we uh, we as an agency had pioneered the horizontal collection system, um, so most of our gas was under vacuum through that system. And we built that system as we went up. So any daily cover, any daily operation, uh, there was always a a system, no more than twenty or forty feet below it, um, and the vertical wells were only used at the slope to prevent any any migration off the site. You know, likewise, the the concept that Bob Healy brought up as as close as you go, that's something we did do on the slopes. Um, we would, as we started a new lift, we would build a a a a, 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 a final cover, a final slope uh, type cover, and then fill behind that as as we went up. So our slopes were basically at final uh, final cover as as we went up. But not every not everybody operates that way. There's different ways of operating. Uh, Nick Lapis had brought up, uh, you know, he had recalled that. Uh, for for the daily operations, um, you know, there there was different ways of doing that. Some some people uh, would would go back to their 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 uh, previous fill and 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 fill again there, pull the cover off, fill. Um, and once again, I'm used to the more of the mega landfills where we didn't do that. We uh, we would do our our daily fill. We'd cover. We do a, a daily cover on that a foot of soil. Or, or a combination of soil and green waste. Um, and then the next day we would just fill right up against there. And we never went back to that. Um, and so I think the, the, the point I'm trying to get across is that in the landfill industry, there is so much variety in how people go about their, their daily business of running and operating that landfill. And a lot of it has to do with the size of the landfills. Um, you know, if you're operating a mega landfill, um, you know, like say a Sunshine Canyon or, or an old Pointy Hills landfill, you're going to operate that much differently than you will uh, a smaller municipal landfill. Uh, and the operation of those sites are going to be day and night for a lot of reasons. And, and, and part of that is, or a good part of that is financial. Uh, and 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 the smaller sites could be municipalities that just just have to be more careful with with their dollars and how they operate things and how they go about uh, doing their daily routines. So I think as you're thinking about ways to improve the LMR, you have to keep that in mind that the one size doesn't necessarily fit all. Um, you know, those were things we had to consider way back when when we were developing this. Um, that that people do operate differently depending upon the size of those sites, um, and so it's, I think it's an important 
important thing to consider as, as, as you're moving forward. Absolutely, Frank. Thank you so much for um, that important clarification and distinction. Uh, and I can absolutely foresee that, you know, as we move along and further develop and kind of hone these concepts, we'll be coming back to all of you for input on, you know, where we should be uh, sort of delineating those thresholds, right, in terms of size or other operational characteristics in terms of, um, you know, who needs to, <laughs> to change their practices or, or be doing something differently. And, um, you know, very much related to that, I think, you know, it would be helpful for us to learn more about um, how challenging or feasible it may be for, you know, landfills that have historically been constructed or operated in one way um, to make the kinds of shifts that we're talking about um, and, and absolutely take the point that that's not always an applicable, you know, um, uh, you know, distinction to make. So thanks so much. Okay, Larry uh, Sweetser, uh, go ahead. Yes, thank you. This is Larry Sweetser. I think Frank gave me a big opening. I'm almost on the ledge task force with him, but I also represent a number of the small rural counties. We have 26 members in our association, and we have a lot of the small landfills. I was part of the original group coming up with the landfill methane regulation as well and, and we had a lot of issues with trying to apply those standards to the small landfills um, particularly those that don't generate enough gas and in fact would be dangerous to try to collect it because there is so little gas at many of these sites and so we definitely need to keep that included and so i'll be glad to participate in those discussions as well great thank you so much larry appreciate that And it looks like Will Scheffler is next in the queue. Um, Will, you've been unmuted. Yeah, Will Scheffler here with Western Placer Waste Management Authority. Um, I, you know, would hope that during the this process that the effects of SB thirteen eighty three be considered. You know, we we uh, extended a lot of capital uh, capital to comply on with it on the front end before it even hits landfill. So it might, you know, the it might be a moving needle. For you know, trying to get more landfill control uh, might not make sense when there's less organic components and thus methane in it. Um, so I would like to you know hope that those effects, uh, you know, once SB thirteen eighty three is in full effect and uh, the changes on on day to day Californian life is felt and how that would impact landfills before we um, do anything too drastic with with landfills themselves. Yeah, thanks for that perspective, Will. Um, definitely take your point there. I mean, I think, you know, on the whole, when we're, you know, of course, looking across the entire state, um, you know, those reductions from, uh, you know, increased uh, or sorry, decreased organic waste disposal are really going to take a while for us to, you know, realize the methane reductions. And one of the reasons that that's the case is um, you know, we provided a, a sort of analysis in the scoping plan looking at, you know, the sort of carbon stock, if you will, of organic waste that's been historically disposed and how the magnitude of that carbon stock of already disposed waste compares to the amount that's being added each year, right? And so the conclusion that we came to, and again, this is, you know, on average or statewide perspective, um, is that, you know, even if we stopped, you know, completely phased out landfilling of organic waste today, um, you know, we would still have these continued uh, significant emissions from the waste that's already in place in landfills uh, for many decades into the future. So that's why we do think it's important that we, you know, identify some more, uh, you know, increased direct emission controls. But I also take your point that, you know, there are going to be some landfills, depending on, you know, their size and other conditions today, um, where it might make less sense, right, to, to sort of make some dramatic change in operational practices or controls and the stringency of, of various provisions. Um, so that's definitely a, a really great point that we will keep in mind. And thanks for the opportunity to sort of um, revisit the 
you know, the, the syn uh, synergy between, you know, organic waste reductions going on into the future and what we're able to do immediately today, um, you know, to reduce the, the pace of warming. Okay, no raised hands at the moment. Um, we could proceed, Joe. All right, uh, the last concept we're considering is improve consistency and clarifying regarding allowable exemptions to the regulation through alternative compliance option request or an ACO. Um, currently, an ACO is considered approved if no response is received within 120 days. ACOs issued early in the program may be outdated. Remember that LMO was adopted in 2010. So staff is considering creating a standard process for new requests, a process for review or revision of existing ACOs and potentially removing or extending the approval deadline. Um, next, after reviewing some ACO requests, we noted that some requests are overly broad or do not contain sufficient information to demonstrate that an alternative is necessary and would provide equivalent methane control and enforceability. So we are considering developing standard prescriptive criteria or guidance for ACO requests. Okay, uh, this is the last or the final topic we would like to discuss today. Um, it is not directly connected to the potential LMR improvements, but we want to use this opportunity to seek information about strategies to maximize the beneficial use of landfill gas. Um, staff has estimated that approximately two thirds of landfill gas collected statewide is currently flared. We have identified an additional 30 to 50 landfill that can capture sufficient methane each year to cost effectively use gas for energy generation, which could potentially double the amount of landfill gas used in California. Um, at the beginning of the presentation, we discussed the 10% reduction in waste emission can be achieved through improved control measures. In addition, the scoping plan identified that increased utilization of landfill gas can contribute to further emission reductions in the energy sector by displacing fossil fuels. Um, to achieve carbon neutrality, the scoping plan analysis projected the need for large increase in utilization of biomethane within the decade. Um, in addition, the April 2023 board resolution adopting the advanced clean fleets regulation recognize the multiple reliable uses for non-fossil biomethane will be needed for successfully implementation of SB 3083. The resolution directs staff to prioritize discussion regarding the use of biomethane in hard to decarbonize sectors, including as a feedback, as a feedstock to produce hydrogen or fuel cell vehicles and to produce electricity to charge EVs. Um, so staff is seeking to better understanding any barriers to beneficial use. We would like to hear from your ideas, perspectives on the various options of using landfill gas and how the state can best support the use of biomethane in hard to decarbonize sectors. Um, finally, we would like to learn, you know, which parameters like the size and gas flow characteristics, a best indicator of whether a energy generation project is viable. Um, with that, we want to pause here and hear your thoughts on this issue. Yeah, we have a question and a or a comment or a question. Uh, oh, there you are, David Rothberg. Go ahead. Thank you. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Very good. David Rothbard with the Los Angeles County Sanitation Districts. Very good topic. And it's one thing I wanted to clarify that, especially with 1383, taking kind of the fuel out of landfills, it becomes harder and harder to find ways to productively use the gas in an energy project or utilize it in some productive way. Uh, we were commenting quite a bit 
through our wastewater association, CASA, during the advanced clean fleet regulation, that it, it, it just was something that was overlooked as far as what to do productively to get SB 1383 to work well and what to do what you get the food waste out of the landfills, how are you going to utilize that properly? But as far as the dilemma here at the landfills, it's something that as you close a landfill down, which is going to happen more rapidly with 1383, now what's going to happen is the quality and quantity of gas from your landfills declines. So it's very difficult to scope out a project to generate electricity and not flare for a number of reasons, because no matter what, you have to manage that gas. So flares need to be there. But as far as the opportunities to find some type of energy project or put it in the pipeline or whatever it is, it's very, very challenging. And we'd like to work with CARB, but it's just something that seems like you almost have to have the separate working group to figure this out. And uh, maybe a parallel or something you could look at as a starting point is we just went through the same exercise with South Coast AQMD pertaining to rule 1118.1. And they're working on a beneficial use document. So we went through this and discussed it at length. It's not finalized, but maybe that's a good starting point for you to look at that and see what opportunities there are. And we'd be happy to work with you to find opportunities. But what I'm saying is it's very difficult. There's very little out there that you can actually enhance the use of the gas that isn't out there already. So hopefully that's helpful. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, David. That is helpful. And, um, you know, as as Joe mentioned, uh, you know, looking at the landfills that do have um, energy generation, energy recovery projects, and, you know, we found, we identified, you know, many similar sized or, you know, that collect a similar amount of methane each year that don't. And so we're really interested in, uh, you know, better understanding, you know, if some that, that appear to be the same based on, you know, these metrics that we're considering um, are able to, you know, cost effectively run that project, then what are the barriers that, you know, it seems like it must be something other than the quantity or, you know, the size of uh, potential amount of energy generation that's possible. Um, so really appreciate your insight if you can provide any any additional feedback or clarity on that. One thing, without getting into too many weeds, one thing that's really a barrier, and I don't know any way to get rid of the barrier, is essentially a lot of landfills are Title V facilities. And when you put in a brand new project, you have to meet backed and backed for combustion processes are getting more and more stringent because of ozone attainment. So you have that battle as far as reducing those NOx emissions at the same time you're trying to beneficially use the gas. And those two things don't necessarily mesh very well. So that's something else you have to consider. Great, thank you. Okay, next up we have Stephen Rosenblum, go ahead. Yeah, um, this has been very interesting for me. I'm, I represent uh, Climate Action California uh, statewide climate organization. I think this issue of beneficial use is something we've really been concerned with. Um, as you all know, the dairy industry has been uh, really pushing the idea of using manure methane as a, as a revenue source. And they, they have no um, incentive to reduce the amount of manure that they produce. Um, I think with the landfills, as, as uh, uh, Mr. Ropar pointed out, there is an incentive to actually reduce the methane emissions and I think that's that's the right way to go, rather than to try to encourage production of more methane or to encourage a uh, a more stable methane supply, as he mentioned, would be required if you're going to put in a project. Um, then the suggestion that methane be converted into hydrogen uh, is is not a good idea. It turns out that studies have shown that you do better um, just burning the methane to produce energy. Uh, or better yet, putting it into a, a methane fuel cell like those produced by Bloom Energy, which produce no um, oxides of nitrogen or ozone um, and produce electricity. And they're, they're mounted on trailer trucks. So you could move one of those onto a site as long as the production was high enough and at least use it to generate on-site electricity for, for the uh, landfill. Uh, until the methane got to a low enough level where it wasn't uh, useful anymore. 
But I think those those bloom cells can actually take methane that's not remedi remediated to pipeline levels. So I really suggest that CARB look into something like that uh, for landfills. Um, and it also occurred to me from one of the previous speakers that if water infiltration is the main uh, component that we can control in methane production, when uh, final covers are evaluated, I think the impermeability to water should be one of the primary considerations to reduce methane production under the cover. So that, that's all I had to say. Thank you very much for the opportunity. And I'd like to thank you for this very interesting uh, workshop. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Stephen. I really appreciate those comments as well. And um, I, you know, I think we would also really love to hear from operators or project developers who might be considering uh, any landfill gas to energy projects, um, more about what types of pathways look the most attractive or feasible. Um, you brought up the issues with hydrogen and the opportunity to use gas powered uh, fuel cells for stationary electric generation. Um, and, you know, we've also considered, you know, are there, well, I guess the way to say this is we wonder if operators are considering, you know, uh, some more, you know, creative or unique opportunities or outlets, right? Is there uh, an industrial, you know, manufacturing facility nearby that could potentially be utilizing your gas to, you know, replace the, the fossil fuels that they're using currently? Um, or, you know, for some of the landfills that might be uh, adding an anaerobic digester project, uh, you know, on site or nearby, right? Are there opportunities for synergy or cooperation there um, to, you know, sort of absorb that, that of course, over time, over decades, declining amount of gas that the landfills will be producing going forward, um, as well as, you know, on site or, or, or nearby, um, you know, vehicle fueling, charging stations, that type of thing, um, you know, landfills fueling their own garbage trucks, you know, there's, there seems to be so many different alternatives out there. Um, and of course, as Joe mentioned, um, the board has emphasized the importance of having many different opportunities because, you know, simply we recognize that it's not one size fit all. And, and you know, some opportunities don't make sense for some people where they're, you know, more cost effective or just technical technologically feasible for others. Um, so that's exactly the type of feedback we're really interested in, in learning more from all of you. Thanks, Stephen. Okay, next up we have Frank Capone. Go ahead. Hi, just real quickly. Um, back in uh, a few years ago when we were developing, working with South Coast AKMD, and uh, David was part of that too, 1118.1, uh, which is the flaring regulation. Uh, and the, there they were trying to also uh, maximize the use of beneficial use of landfill gas. So we went through a lot of these discussions. So I, I encourage you to talk to them. But um, you know, one of the things I know I looked at at the time, uh, I had actually uh, went through an effort of looking at every landfill in the South Coast Hey Kim Dean. I'm glad to share this with you. Um, and, and was able to uh, put together a nice graph that, that clearly shows that there's a break point in gas generation below which you're just gonna flare uh, because it's not economical to, you don't have enough gas to really justify any kind of landfill gas energy system. And above that, you start to see uh, the landfill gas energy systems. Um, so I think, you know, the economics and the market have already dictated who has gone in that direction, who's not gone in that direction. Um, and if you've already gone in the direction of a beneficial use project, um, you know, you have a, a long-term commitment, usually financial commitment to that. So you're not gonna easily break away from that and do something different. Um, so I think, and David pointed out, there's just, I think there's not a lot of other opportunities uh, with landfill gas to, uh, to increase the beneficial use. Um, you know, in, in, in terms of uh, using the gas as a biomethane in fleets, um, some have already doing that, uh, but I don't see any new projects coming online from the landfills because quite frankly, the ACF uh, that was just passed by your board has pretty much taken away the incentive for any new projects to happen. 
Um, so I, I don't see that happening at all. And quite frankly, I'm not a, a big proponent or think very much of hydrogen. Um, so the only thing left is putting gas in pipelines. Uh, and then you're faced with AB 1900, uh, which has a, a significant amount of barriers uh, to move forward to, to, to get gas to the point where you can put it in a pipeline. So I think in terms of landfills, I don't see a lot of a lot of additional ability out there to beneficially use the gas beyond what's already happening. Uh, it's already been pointed out digesters uh, may be the way to to maximize the use of 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 uh, biomethane. Um, and you're still dealing with the barriers that I just talked about. Um, once again, I think the the ACF has has taken away a lot of incentives to use it in fleets, um, and then you you're you're stuck with it with uh, putting it in a pipeline and having to deal with AB nineteen hundred, uh, which which has a lot of barriers in doing that. So, um, yeah, I think there's a lot of things to look at here, and there's certainly a lot of barriers uh, that really need to come down to be able to incentivize uh, the use of gas. Thanks so much for those perspectives, Frank. Um, there's definitely a lot there, but um, you know, I think it is imperative for us to, you know, understand the barriers, whether those are technical or market barriers or even policy barriers, you know, so that we can craft the right policy interventions or you know put incentives in the right place to help folks overcome those challenges. Um, you know, the scoping plan really showed us how much we need to accelerate decarbonization of you know both the the fossil gas grid and the electrical grid in order to achieve our greenhouse gas targets and carbon neutrality in the long run. So, um, you know, I think we understand that projects can't be done overnight, but, you know, we all want to be thinking about 2030 that's just around the corner um, and as much as possible, you know, um, get biogas into non-combustion or other clean advanced uh, uses. So I think you brought up a great point about the pipeline standards uh, or specifications that can be a barrier. And we'd love to learn more about other sort of practical, practical or technical considerations along those same lines. Um, and uh, I think the final thing you, you mentioned um, that I wanted to comment on is the economics. And that's um, sort of a question we wanted to pose to folks as well. You know, we wonder, the extent to which folks may have looked into the economics in the past and, you know, deemed that it wasn't feasible, but, um, you know, we wonder if it isn't time to sort of reevaluate mm -hmm. as market conditions change, right, as new incentive opportunities come along. Um, so really appreciate all of those perspectives and, uh, and helping us to keep all of those things in mind as we move forward. Okay, next up we have uh, Graham Noyce. Go ahead. Should be unmuted. Oh, thanks. I didn't see that button come up. Uh, Graham Noyes, I do a lot of work with companies uh, in the transportation sector in particular. Uh, really appreciate uh, the uh, the workshop today and all the work and, and thought that went into this and, and the opportunity for stakeholders to engage uh, on it. Uh, I, I thought David uh, David's idea was a good one about potentially a, a working group uh, around the beneficial uses. Uh, I think that potentially there could be uh, opportunities uh, within the low carbon fuel standard uh, to utilize um, the, uh, you know, particularly, I think, electricity, even if it's relatively small scale uh, quantities that might, you know, certainly doesn't have the barriers to entry that you see with interconnection requirements or, or pipeline quality standards. Uh, and wondered, uh, uh, Anthony, whether, you know, there has been, uh, you know, whether there are any um, uh, flaring LCFS pathways, uh, so to speak, out there uh, in, uh, uh, in in existence, uh, to, to your knowledge at, uh, at this point. I mean, avoidance, uh, avoidance of flaring, essentially, for use as uh, for power generation. Thanks, Graham. Yeah, that's an interesting question. Um, you know, certainly the way the LCFS um, credit calculation is designed, it does 
reward folks for the displacement of fossil fuels in, in you know, transportation vehicles um, that would occur if the, you know, the resource was flared rather than used for energy. So, um, you know, I think that's built in if, if that answers your question. Yeah, I was actually asking if anyone had done that yet and gotten a, gotten a score for it. I, I imagine not. I haven't haven't seen that out there, but I think it's interesting to explore. Great, thanks for your comments. Okay, next up is Bill McGavern. Bill, you could unmute yourself. Thanks very much, Bill McGavern with the Coalition for Clean Air, and I actually have a, a broad comment on today's workshop since we're I think nearing the end. Um, just want to say that we strongly support moving ahead with uh, a new and improved landfill methane regulation. I actually worked on the original rule as an early action measure back when I was at Sierra Club California. And I think we really are overdue to update the rule, uh, particularly given the new technologies and tools that are available for detecting and reducing emissions. The legislature and the board have rightfully prioritized reducing methane emissions. Methane, of course, is a, a powerful short-lived climate pollutant or super pollutant. And it's critical that we do everything we can to reduce the emissions. We know that the landfill sector is a significant source of those emissions. And since we have ways that we can continue to bring those emissions down, we should be doing that. So uh, I look forward to working with you um, on successfully bringing this rule to the board. Wonderful, thank you for that support, Bill. Okay, we have about 15 minutes left, so plenty of time for questions. I don't see any raised hands at the moment. We could go back to the slide as well. Yeah, so this really concludes our concepts for potential improvement to the LMR. Um, Staff welcomes your input and participation. No, I think you were muted if you were speaking. Can you hear me now? Yeah. Um, staff welcomes your input and participation as we further develop this concept. We're happy to take more questions as you and you can submit, you know, written feedback to the public comment docket on the LMR meeting and workshop page as shown here. Um, yeah, we want to give you a reminder regarding the timeline as well. Uh, feedback requested by June the 18th, a month right. from now. Uh, no board date yet. The meeting is the first step to gather feedback from, from all of you. Um, the formal regulation process may take a year, so the earliest could implement in 2025. With yeah. that? Joe, just a quick note. Uh, <clears throat> the June 18th is actually a weekend, so it's June 19th on the, the comment period close. Um, Thanks for that, Matt. Oh, yeah, sure. Um, I just want to wrap up by saying thank you to everybody who joined us today. It's been, I think, a really productive almost three hours on, on landfill methane emissions. And I think we are really heartened by the quality of the comments that we've gotten and the level of participation we've had over the past couple of hours. Um, I, to, to reiterate Joe's point, uh, we would really appreciate it if those of you who have engaged could take the time to provide those comments as well as any others that you might have in writing to the docket. Um, you can also use that opportunity to point us to other data that we should be considering or things we might not have thought of. Um, and as also he said, you can contact us at this email that will go directly to uh, Anthe, Joe, Sean, and myself. And we encourage you to subscribe for updates on future workshops or other developments in this area. So again, thank you very much. I think it's been a great couple of hours um, and seeing no other questions right now, uh, this concludes the workshop. Thank you very much. Thank, Thank you, you everyone. For time with us.